But today, um, it's my pleasure to introduce a new professor um, at the University of South Alabama, at least new um, just last year. So Dr. Kashuk um, Wenkateshwaran, and he has, uh, he's an assistant professor at South in the Department of Civil, Coastal and Environmental Engineering. And um, so this provides a nice applied way to do science, right? So I think it will be really great for the particularly graduate students as you think of next steps. There are other ways you can apply the science that you've been doing in your master's and PhD programs. So um, Kashuk is a great resource for that. So hit him up um, for any questions related to that. But um, he did his PhD um, in Marquette and in civil engineering. And at the moment in um, the engineering department itself is more on the, on the environmental engineering side. Um, so he'll talk about some of that today. But for those of you that have seen me host before, I love to do a little bit of what about this person and not just the scientist. So Kushik is a Milwaukee Bucks fan for those out there in the know and enjoys fishing and is really looking forward to expanding his fishing knowledge and, and you know, experience in the Gulf of Mexico here. <laughs> so please welcome Kushik yes, today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alison, and uh, thank you all for being here and inviting me as well. It's a pleasure. Um, I've heard about EISL ever since my interview. Um, wanted to come here, visit. Um, I did visit here to the aquarium, of course, brought my family, my wife to watch the aquarium, but this is the first time I'm at the other fun end of the DISL, which is where all the fun research happens. So, so today, uh, my talk would be you know, primarily introducing myself. So I, as Alison mentioned, I joined South uh, last year. So, and then I'll talk about my education background, my work experience, and of course the topic of the day, which is the environmental biotechnology and how it's applied for bioremediation. So that's basically one of the aspects of my research. So I'll talk about what it means, what projects have I done as an example, and what I intend to do, uh, which is the current research project at South. So my background, so I hail from uh, New Delhi, India. So that's where the capital of the country is. Uh, pretty much grew up there for most of my life. Uh, but for my bachelor's, I was somewhere in the south uh, near that place, Telangana. That's where a city Hyderabad is. That's where my university, uh, ICFAI University was. Now, so I did my bachelor's in biotechnology. So India, this was mid nineties to I think 2000s was trying to be the hub of well, biotechnology, basically pharma. Uh, you know, India is known for an IT capital, but it was also trying to be the pharma capital. Well, it is kind of, but that notion was tested last two years in the vaccine development. Yeah, I would probably give us a C minus at best on that, right? So yeah, so at that time, there were a lot of these universities with this biotechnology program. So I was interested in biology, not purely into engineering. So this was a good balance for me. So that's why I went in. My plan was to be in the pharma side of things, drug development, et cetera. However, a chance internship at the Indian Institute of Chemical Technology switched. Uh, I, over there, I worked with Dr. Mohan and he was actually working on uh, a project biohydrogen production from industrial wastewater. Now, why did I apply for internship over there? Actually, I did not. I applied to a toxicology lab because I was still interested in pharma, but this institute is really popular. I couldn't get in. I got to a lab right next door and that's where Dr. Mohan was working. So I just joined in. I thought I can bleed in, learn with of both, but then I fell in love with this research. So basically what they were doing here, they were taking industrial wastewater, nasty stuff, and making hydrogen out of it. And they were using a biological micro, microorganism to do it. So that completely blew my mind that you can use microbes to take something wasteful uh, and make something useful out of it. So that spurred my interest into the field of environmental engineering in general. So I packed my bags after my bachelor's uh, and then I wanted to do a master's. And then I left and went to Potsdam, New York. So from New Delhi to way up there in the border between US and Canada. Uh, a town of 5,000 residents going from, I don't know, 25 million, uh, you know, basically a college town. So it was a completely different cultural shock and also a lot of snow. 
Uh, but yeah, so did my master's there in civil and environmental engineering. I worked with, uh, I worked under Dr. Grimberg. Uh, there, I got my first stint into the field of biological processes. So going from that small internship, looking at biohydrogen, now we are going into the digester of dairy manure. Did not know that. Most Indians think New York is the New York City. That's it. Uh, but it's a big state. A uh, lot of it behind the city part. Uh, so, and it's also a farming state. Again, did not know that. Thought there was snow all the time over there. Uh, so a lot of CAFOs, which are concentrated animal farming operations. So 5,000, 10,000 head cow farms everywhere dotted in New York. So they have a lot of dairy manure. They need to get rid of it. So one of the major ways is to use this anaerobic digestion method. I'll talk about it in more detail. So that's me over there collecting buckets of manure every week for my research, uh, which was fun. And that's also my hand over there. That's basically biogas from one of those small serum bottles. I'll talk about that too. So that is actually a demo which I do for high school where you show that the gas is coming out of this waste. So that's methane being burnt. Uh, then I pack my bags again. So masters after that uh, for my PhD, I went uh, westwards to Milwaukee, another cold place. Uh, there at Marquette University, I worked with Dr. Zitomer, uh, who was my PhD advisor. And then I, you know, why did I go there? Well, his ad said two things, anaerobic biotechnology. So my bachelor's was in biotechnology, my master's was in anaerobic digestion. And I was like, okay, they're combining both of them. Uh, and he wanted a, someone with my background who has some biology background and some engineering background. So yeah, we joined hands and we worked on two projects. I'll be talking about one of them today. And this was basically now using my skills in biotechnology, you know, understanding microbes and how it actually can help design an engineering system. Uh, so that's basically what this was. And uh, so I graduated in 2016 and then I did my postdoc and I was also a research assistant professor at Marquette. So I stayed back for a few years uh, I kind of knew by that time what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a professor, I wanted to teach, so I wanted to build my resume. So I taught a few courses, mostly graduate level courses, and conducted research. Uh, if I have to broadly summarize it, uh, I would say it's on contaminant removal and resource recovery, right? So again, I'll explain in more detail what that is. And of course, the two ways I approach uh, that objective was using physical chemical processes. Uh, I won't be talking about that today, but I'll be more talking about the second approach, which is using environmental biotechnology. And then after my postdoc in 2021, I finally moved to a warm place uh, over here in uh, Mobile. Uh, so I joined uh, August of last year. Um, so I currently teach two courses. Uh, one is the Intro to Environmental Engineering, which is also the uh, uh, part of the elective in the marine sciences, marine conservation, and also environmental toxicology program, which is fundamentals to environmental engineering. So it's uh, co-listed along that. So I have some students from uh, Department of Marine Sciences and Conservation uh, in my classes. So, uh, and then I also teach a senior level course looking at water wastewater treatment design. And my research objective overall is the same. So uh, nothing much changed. The only thing is now I'm in control rather than <laughs> and I have the funds to do the work. So basically that's how it is. So that's my background. So now we'll talk about uh, the main topic, uh, which is also my research topic of today. So which is environmental biotechnology for bioremediation. Now, what is environmental biotechnology? Now, I'm sure most of you know, it's a branch of science and engineering, uh, which uses biological processes, or at least focuses on using biological processes and bioproducts. And the objective is to use it for environmental or treating environmental concerns. So what are our environmental concerns? Well, the major one is climate change, basically fossil fuel usage. So anyone can think of an example how environmental biotechnology helped there? There's some students here. Sorry, I'm still a professor, so I can ask questions. Anyone can think of climate change, fossil fuels, yes. There you go, biofuel. So how do you, you know, developing biodiesel using algae or some kind of microbes that's part of environmental biotechnology, using that to obviously replace fossil fuels. So it helps with climate change, right? So that's one example. Uh, other ways, any other example? How about in water treatment or wastewater treatment? Anyone can think of? No? Well, just let you know, a lot of your wastewater are treated biologically. 
well, I would say most of it, it is. If it's, they're doing a good job, it must be some biological in there, right? So that's an bio, environmental biotechnology. You're using microbes to treat wastewater, right? So that it doesn't contaminate your rivers and streets. So that's another way. The more fancy way you might see is you hear about, you know, news of a micro which can degrade benzene if there is an oil spill, or, you know, you hear about some micro which can degrade plastics, which is now the big thing, right? So those are the fancy new cutting edge stuff. But if you want to talk about classic wastewater treatment, that's environmental biotechnology, right? So, uh, so what I focus on, what are the problems I'm focused on uh, in the past and in the going forward as well is one of them is looking at nutrient recovery. So the picture on the left here. So looking at how we can get rid of phosphorus from our wastewater. When I say get rid of, not just remove it, but recover it. So the term recovery means that you are removing it and then reusing it, right? Fertilizers are really important. Well, phosphorus is really important. Uh, if you didn't know, I think there are only five countries in the world which control 90% of all the phosphorus. Do you know which is number one? Anyone? Let's just take a guess. What do you think? US. The US is there, but not number one. India. Nope. We are actually far behind for the size of our country. Mm -hmm. Morocco. Yeah, I know. No one would have guessed that. Yeah. Main export, Morocco, phosphorus. Very rich country, by the, by the way, because of that. Uh, but by the way, we are running out of phosphorus. Uh, a lot of the reasons our food prices are going up is because phosphorus rocks are running out and there are monopolies. Five countries are controlling it. So, you know, you know, we talk about what's the next conflict, water. Yeah, phosphorus is going to be one of them as well because it's such an essential nutrient for life in general, but for our agriculture, right? But here's the weird thing about phosphorus. Phosphorus is at least in our nature, neither created or destroyed. It's there, right? You can't burn phosphorus away. It just remains, right? So whenever we eat phosphorus, it comes out, it's in the water. Can we use it again, right? Why we have to rely? If we can somehow circulate the phosphorus in our own system, in our own community, and in our own country, we don't have to rely on it. We'll be self-sustaining. So that's the envision. And there's a lot of money being spent by US through NSF grants and EPA grants into removing phosphorus and recovering it, okay? So it's a lot of money in that. Uh, I'm talking about money also in terms of private companies looking into this as well, right? Uh, what's the next one? Uh, the next big uh, project I'm looking into is contaminant removal. Again, a very broad term. That's because that list changes all the time. So what's the contaminant I'm interested in right now? PFAS. Anyone heard of PFAS? PFA, polyfluorinated alkanoid substances, no? Uh, all the nonstick stuff you have, it has PFAS in it. And uh, it's been around since 1940s. People knew it was a problem back then, but of course, you know, nothing happens. Uh, eventually they figured out it was a lot of problems. The companies were told not to use it. Uh, what the companies did, they made a smaller version of it and said that, oh, it's smaller, it's different. It'll, it will be fine. But we found out that, no, it's not fine. It's even worse. It gets into your lymphatic systems and it causes more problems. So hurrah. So um, by the way, 99%, 99.99% of every resident in US has PFAS in their blood, including me. So yeah. So that's the next big challenge, PFAS, right? How do we get rid of it? They are known as forever chemicals. Don't break. That's why they were made. Uh, uh, chemically, physically, we have a way to remove it, but what do we do with it? It's still around. We can't throw it in a rocket and fly it off, right? So so my idea and my hope, well, hypothesis is that the biology would come up with a solution before the chemical one. So that's one of the contaminants that I'm interested in, uh, amongst others. And finally, looking at high strength wastewater. What's a high strength wastewater? So, well, what we flush, what our wastewater is domestic, it's not considered high strength. Uh, it has roughly 300 to 500 milligrams per liter of BOD. You're, aware of the term BOD, biological oxygen demand, right? So it's, in a short, it's a measure of oxygen demand. That means how much oxygen can be consumed by the contaminant in the water, which is a bad thing. That means there are food in the water and microbes use oxygen to eat the food. So your oxygen demand is coming from there, right? So 300, 500. High strength is more than a gram. Uh, so it's like dairy manure or like from brewery wastewater, you know, something strong like that, a lot more cut. Uh, so, but you know, US, a lot of meat products here, you have a lot of cows, 
and they produce a lot of manure, right? So it's a problem you might not see all the time, but trust me, it's there. And we have to find a way to you know, fix that too. It's not just about the waste as well, it's all about the pathogens. There's a lot of pathogens in these waste, dairy manure. Uh, there was an E. coli outbreak, this was around eight years ago, where all subway spinach had to be taken back. That was because of E. coli from manure spray in New York. So these kind of things happen quite a lot. It connects and hits all of us. So these are the major challenges, right? Uh, that I'm interested into looking at and more focused on the biological treatments and processes. Now, what's a biological product? Uh, mostly when we talk about biological product, we talk about proteins, right? So these proteins, uh, they help in absorption, they help in breaking down stuff. So that's what I mean by biological products in general. There are other ways you can talk about it, like example, biofuels, but that's already a product which can be used. But here I'm looking at a biomolecule that can actually do something to our contaminants. And obviously the other set of biological systems would be microorganisms. So uh, going forward, I'll be talking about two projects that I did during my PhD and my postdoc. One used microorganisms and the other used proteins. And I'll show you how I use them to uh, tackle some of the environmental concerns. So starting with proteins in bioremediation. Now, application of proteins in bioremediation or in wastewater treatment is not new. Okay, so these are some of these enzymes which have already been used. Oxidoreductase, lacases, some of them you might be aware of, right? Uh, what about lacases? You guys have heard of that one, right? Fungus comes for fungus, right? Mainly, yes, right? Yeah, all right. okay, good. Uh, sorry, again, professor here. Uh, so yeah, so these enzymes, right, which are proteins, right, they are usually used for breaking down stuff, right? So these are, you know, the last end AS, ASES tells you the story here. So some breaks hydrogen bonds, some uses uh, oxidation to break compounds, right? So they have used this to break pesticides. They have used this to break organic pollutants, things like that, right? But have you noticed these are enzymes, right? All enzymes are proteins, but not all proteins are enzymes, right? You have muscle protein, you have structural proteins. So enzymes have been used a lot. I'm also interested in using enzymes. I'll talk about a project which I'm doing right now as well. But the main project I'm gonna talk about is a carrier protein. So this was a unique, one of the unique aspects of that project, which was we actually used a carrier protein. So what are carrier proteins? Well, these are proteins usually in cell membrane and they help carry stuff through, right? So if you have phosphorus on the outside, this protein helps push it in. Same with exchange inside to outside as well. So these are carrier proteins. So just like that blue uh, um, uh, protein example over there, right? So now how did we use this? So one of the main questions we had, as I mentioned, phosphorus, right? It's a really important nutrient. We are running out of it and we want to find a way to remove it. Now, currently, the technology we have are mostly chemical uh, processes for removing phosphorus. It's a precipitation for a reaction. So you add calcium or you add iron and it binds with the phosphate and precipitates out. Problem is, you, it works well, but it does not reduce it enough. For example, uh, after reducing it to, let's say, 100 micrograms per liter, which is what, 0.1 milligrams per liter, the chemical reaction does not work very well. You have to add more chemical, more than you need to get it done. And then you're adding a chemical as well. That's another pollutant, iron and calcium, right? You wanna get rid of that too. So there has been a, there's been a thermodynamic wall that we have reached that getting it below 50 microgram per liter required a lot of resources, right? And the absorbent out there could not do it. That was the main, one of the main challenges. So. Our hypothesis was this, I worked with Dr. Brooke Mayer uh, at Marquette University that there might, there must be a protein out there. Well, we knew there was a protein out there, right? And the name of that protein was PSTS, right? Now, what is this protein? Now, on the right, you see a, a simple diagram of a cell, a bacteria, E. coli, on the right-hand side. There you see two kinds of carrier protein system. One is the PST and the other is the PIT, right? Now, when there is enough phosphorus in the environment, that means you know it's not a rare element for them to find, right? So they use a system known as a PIT, right? 
it's generally just an open gate kind of system, right? It has very little, uh, what you call specificity, but it just opens the gates, phosphorus comes in, everyone's happy, right? But phosphorus is are very rare in freshwater environments, right? So, but we have bacteria living in those specific water environments as well. There are regions out there where phosphorus is limited. So what do they do? Well, they have another system known as the PST, and they are, that's phosphate specific transporter. That protein is highly, highly specific for phosphorus. Why? First of all, you are in an environment where phosphorus is rare. The last thing you want to do is grab the wrong stuff, right? Because I, as I said, phosphorus, you know, it's important. It's in your DNA. It's all your structures, right? The last thing you want to do is grab the wrong stuff and stick it into somewhere which does not, your cell will die, right? So that's why this life has evolved over billions of years to figure out Okay, if we have enough phosphorus, it's fine. I'll open the gates, everyone's good. But what if I, what happens if I'm in a very uh, limited environment? So they have come up with this protein system. And in that specifically, uh, the protein on the top, you can see is PSTS. That's one of the units. That's the one which grabs the phosphorus, right? So it's a multi-protein system. You have the one which grabs it and the other protein helps move it into the cell, right? But the main person, main, uh, you know, the section or the unit is the grabber, right? It has to identify amongst all the other stuff bumping into it that, oh, arsenate, I don't want that. Nitrate, I don't want that. Phosphate, I don't want that, right? So that's where the main protein comes in. So our hypothesis was, why not we use that protein as an absorbent? It is designed over billions of years to grab phosphorus. It's known to be a high affinity. That means it can grab below 100 microgram per liter. So why not use that? Well. Well, it's obviously that's what we did, but some people have done that before too. Like there was a proof of concept study where they grew microbes with this protein, a lot of it, right? You can overexpress some proteins. You can make the microbe overexpress a protein. So instead of having, let's say, you know, 100, they made them have like a thousand. And you notice these microbes can then grab more phosphorus. Okay, there you go. Prove the hypothesis. This protein helps. Another set of researchers came, they took this protein and stuck it to a surface, took it out of the micro, stuck it to a surface. And they showed that this surface can now absorb phosphorus, like an absorbent. Awesome, all right? So what's the next challenge? Well, the next challenge was, remember I said we want to recover phosphorus? So this protein have to release the phosphorus too. That was the main challenge. Okay, you can grab it, but can you give it back? And also, I can destroy you and you can give it back but that's a lot of resources wasted. Proteins are not easy to grow. It takes a lot of effort, right? Molecular level of skill. So I want you to give it back to me again and again. So basically you grab it, then I ask you to give it, then you grab it again and work as a re reusable absorber. That's what the market needs. So that was the big challenge. Can you absorb and can you recover? So what was my approach? So one second. So my approach, uh, I found a PSTS gene from E. coli. I uh, stuck it into a plasmid with ampicillin resistance gene in it, transformed it into an E. coli cell. Oh, I should move my mouse. E. coli cell over here, plated it, um, you know, uh, what do you call, grew the cells, extracted the protein, and then I stuck it to a bead surface. Uh, what I took 15 seconds to explain, took me a year and a half, actually. So, well, yeah. 14 months. So yeah, easier said than done, even though the, if the gene is available, uh, it's pretty, you know, it takes a few tries to get them perfectly in and get the right protein you want and stuff like that. But so after we did that, so now we have these beads. So these beads are commercially available. They're used for protein purification. So you can use these beads to purify the protein you're interested in out of a thousand protein in a solution. But instead of, so what they do is they run the protein solution through it. This beads will grab the protein you want and the rest of them will flow. And then you can make the bead release the protein you want. So you purify your samples like that, right? But in our case, we didn't ask it to release. We just said, keep the protein and just we'll use you as a surface. So that's what we did here. So we use these beads, immobilize the protein onto it. So PVP stands for phosphate binding protein. So just PVP. So we immobilized it, then we filled a column with these beads, and then we ran them as a column system, an absorption system. So we ran some synthetic wastewater, 
Uh, basically, it's just DI water with a few ions in it and phosphorus in it uh, through these columns, and we made them absorb the phosphorus, right? So the first set of experiment was, okay, we made them absorb the phosphorus, now give it back. How do you make a protein give it back the phosphorus? Anyone know? We didn't either. So we tried everything. So we tried, well, we didn't try one thing which we were, was in the plan. So we tried pH, different pH conditions. We tried different temperatures. Uh, we tried ionic strength, which is, to be honest, not a practical thing to do. You cannot change the ionic strength of your wastewater that easily. You know, how do you dilute something? You would put fresh water in it? It's, no, right? But we just wanted to try it from the fundamental side of things, right? Uh, the fourth thing we wanted to try was zap it. Uh, but we didn't get to that because one of them worked really well, which was the pH. We found that uh, at high pH, when I say high pH, I mean 12.5, so pushing it, uh, these proteins would give the phosphorus away, right? Basically, release it. And the reason for it, uh, I should say, yeah, we'll come to that. So the reason for it is not because the protein is doing something or the pH is doing something to the protein, the pH is doing something to the phosphorus. So phosphorus, if you uh, like recall, they can exist in a few forms. You can have H3PO4, you can have H2PO4, you can have HPO4 and just PO4. These are the protons. And based on which pH you are in, you can either get more protons or less protons. So at pH 12.5, there are no protons. It just exists as PO4. And this protein does not bind to that. This protein is designed to bind in the neutral range where you have at least one or two protons attached to it. When you have three protons, it doesn't absorb. When you have no protons, it does not absorb. Because why? Life does not like to live over there. They figured out for this region, right? Makes sense, right? So if they could figure, if it could buy pH 12 too, then you have to figure out why they exist to begin with. Maybe that micro came from an environment from pH 2 there, right? But this protein is very common. It's quite ubiquitous, so neutral range. So we found that, okay, pH 12 releases it, right? So before we, so, and then after that, we did few testing on how often it can release it and how quickly it releases it. So before I get to that, first looking at the absorption, right? So we tested the absorption of this protein. So we ran, as I said, water through it uh, with phosphorus, saw how much it absorbed, right? And compared it with existing absorbent. When I say existing absorbent, I'm talking which are commercially available and are still are in development stages. So in this plot, so this is from one of the papers we published. So on the y-axis, you have the Langmuir constant. So this is a constant which gives you an indication of the affinity of a absorber, basically meaning how low a concentration can be where this absorbent can still absorb a phosphorus, right? So the lower, the better. So basically, the higher the affinity, that means even if you have 50 microgram per liter of phosphorus, this protein can still absorb it right? Higher affinity. That means it's able to grab even the smallest of amounts, right? So the higher, the better, the lower, the worse, right? Okay. And on the x-axis, you have the absorption rate. The last thing you want to do as an engineer is wait for months to remove phosphorus, right? You want everything to happen in hours or even days. So the quicker you absorb, the better. So on the left, if you're more on the left side, it's better. And more on the high side, it's better. So, and these dots represent all the existing absorbance out there, including the ones which are still in the lab phase. And you can see the PVP resin surpasses it. Uh, it surpasses it in uh, its affinity almost by 10 times. And it also surpasses in terms of the time. So this T95, uh, it's how much time it takes to absorb to 95% of its capacity, right? So if you have, let's say, uh, it, if you have a given amount of absorbent, which can absorb 100 grams, how much time it takes to get to 95 of that 100, right? So, and these phosphorus uh, binding proteins were able to surpass anything with that we know, uh, which was a remarkable find on that itself. So that was the first thing. It can absorb better than anything that we know. Now, this was the main objective. Can it recover, right? Can it release the phosphorus? So I told you at pH 12, it can release it, but how many times, right? pH 12 is pretty caustic, pretty corrosive, right? You know, it can degrade metals, it can corrode metals. Can it? Can a protein handle it? Well, I'll show, uh, I'll explain what this plot is. So on the left, you have percent of phosphorus absorbed or dissolved. So this 100% means, again, if this amount of protein in this column can absorb 100 grams, that's 100. 
And if it's absorbed 90 grams, then 90%. Okay, so theoretically, I filled a column which can, let's say, absorb 100 grams of phosphorus, right? And then I ran this experiment and I saw how much they absorbed over time. So in the first cycle, I just gave them some phosphorus to absorb. Okay, here you go, pH 7. And they absorbed up to around 78% of their capacity. So not 100%, right? By the way, it's hard to get 100%. That's because not all the proteins remain as proteins. You know, they degrade over time. So roughly any, anywhere near 90 is good. Okay, so they gave me around 80% absorption. Then I exposed it to pH 12. So this yellow bar you see here, that's when I ran pH 12 through the column, right? And that's the amount of phosphorus which came out. You notice there is some extra there. Uh, that happens because when you're growing these proteins in a bacteria, you have to give those bacteria phosphorus. So you have some phosphorus in the protein to start with, right? So, so you got some extra out. Okay, so now I've exposed this to pH 12. Now I'm running pH 7 through it again with phosphorus in it. Now that's the blue bar next to it. So it absorbed again. Oh, I'm sorry. The yellow bar is absorbed and the blue bar is dissolved. I apologize. So the yellow bar is being absorbed and the blue bar is releasing it. Then I make it absorb again, release again, absorb again, release again. Basically, for 10 cycles, I expose them to pH 12.5. And you can see there is no appreciable decrease, statistical decrease in its absorption. For 10 cycles, these proteins could handle pH 12.5. That was another amazing find. We just thought this protein would just die after the first attempt, but they were able to handle 12 cycles of pH 12.5. So not only uh, they were able to absorb, but we could get everything they absorbed out. Statistically, there's not much difference between how much they absorbed and how much they dissolved. So basically we got 90 to 90, 95 to 99% of all the phosphorus they absorbed back, right? So they can do, uh, so they can absorb better than any uh, material we know, and they can also recover. And finally, uh, the advantages of proteins, as I said, they are very specific. So they have designed and evolved over the years to figure out what they need and not. Uh, one of the major problems when it comes to phosphate removal is arsenate. Arsenate and phosphate have very similar structures. And that's one of the reasons why arsenate is toxic to humans too, because your body cannot differentiate and it tries to stick arsenate wherever phosphate needs to go, right? So a lot of the absorbents that we use now commercially are actually designed for arsenate removal. And then they apply it for phosphate removal, right? Because that's where the money is. Arsenate is toxic. Health has more money than environment. Right now. So that's what they are developing for. Uh, so our hypothesis was, well, these proteins can absorb more specifically. So again, on the y-axis, you have, uh, uh, it says nanomoles of arsenate uh, or nanomole of phosphate absorbed. So the one means again, 100% of the capacity. Here we added different ratios of arsenate. So here you have no arsenate, just phosphate. Here we have 10% and then we have around 200% arsenate to phosphate ratio. And if you don't see any yellow bars, uh, yellow color, that means that these proteins were able to differentiate. So you have twice as much arsenate than phosphate floating around. And these proteins were almost 99.9% uh, absorbing only phosphorus. And there's no absorbent out there which can do that right now. So that kind of shows you the power of biology and using biotechnology. There are certain solutions that we don't have, not sure we can even have that mother nature has figured out. So this is like a concept of biomimicry. You're learning from nature and applying it for something on the engineering side, right? So in conclusion from this research, uh, PBP-based absorbent can uh, absorb uh, and obviously recover phosphorus. Uh, they have very high affinity, selectivity, and rate of absorption. And these absorb absorbent can be reused. That was the other one. Uh, the main, main work that we have to work on future is to look at how we can increase the density. Right now, these proteins are huge molecules, right? If an iron molecule is this big, that protein is bigger than this room, right? So you cannot stick a lot of them in a given surface area. So if you want to have more phosphorus to remove, you need more protein. That means you need more space. So that's where the issue is. How can we increase the density so that we don't have a big treatment system? We can have a small treatment system. So. All right. So the second project, I'll quickly go through this, uh, is to look at how we can use microorganisms uh, for bioremediation. So one of the systems I worked with, this was my PhD project, was looking at anaerobic digestion. You guys heard of that? Anaerobic digestion. Biogas plants, right? So basically in anaerobic digestion, you use anaerobic microbes 
uh, to break down organic waste, high strength organic waste to produce methane and CO2. So you get two, you know, two birds with one stone, you are able to remove carbon from the wastewater and you're making methane out of it, which you can burn and get some energy out of it, right? To run the system. And so this is basically a simple schematic of how it happens. You have the first stage hydrolysis done by hydrolytic bacteria, which break down bigger molecules into smaller molecules. Then you have the acetogenesis done by acetogens. They produce acids, volatile fatty acids. Then they produce acetate. They are a different set of microbes. And then you have the methanogens at the end who make the methane, right? So you have these four phases of microbes. By the way, it's very simplistic. Uh, if you see the modern diagram, you'll see like 15 other arrows going all over the place, right? So this is like the 20 year old way of uh, looking at things. So, right, so these are the stages. So now what was my project? Now anaerobic digestion has been around for hundreds of years, right? Uh, people know how to use it, dig a hole, put some waste in there, close it, wait for a month, you get biomass, right? But no one wants to wait for a month. Everyone wants to do this in days. So that means you need to now perfect the system so that you can treat your waste quickly and get enough methane out of it, right? So when you have to make a system like that, you need to have a good model, right? You can't just be like, let me have a gut feel, right? Millions of dollars are spent on this stuff to build this. So the model we use right now, it's known as anaerobic digester model one, uh, which does not include any microbes. You think about it, it's a biological process. And all we look at is pH, temperature, Oh, and we just guesstimate these microbes must be there. So let's use this standard value and stuff like that. Uh, well, clearly it doesn't work all the time, right? So you have issues of foaming. You get a lot of these digesters, which, you know, don't run. Uh, and one of the hypotheses we had is, well, you're not using the main players here, microbes. You need to include that information and times have changed. DNA sequencing is not expensive anymore. You can figure out a community analysis quickly. So why not include that information into your model, right? That was our hypothesis, not just make it about physical stuff. Let's make it about some microbes as well. So can we better predict digester function by inputting data on exact microbes in the digester? So that was a question. So how do we do this? Uh, well, as you might all know, running biological system is not easy, right? Uh, it's not like a computer programming or engineer. Some of my friends are who I hate because they can just take their laptop home and work. Uh, but if you're running this stuff, you have to be there. So not much holidays for the four years of my PhD. Uh, I ran around 150 digesters, uh, each seeded with 50 sludges, anaerobic sludges from 49 states. Why 49? We wanted to get 50 sludges from 50 states to make it nice and even, but Rhode Island did not have an anaerobic digester. So we got it from, well, two from Wisconsin, right? So we got, so the, what was the idea? Get a diverse community, right? This is like weather modeling, right? You knew a few things, but not everything. So what do you do? You just monitor and see, oh, there was a hurricane there. What happened? Temperature went up, dew went down, something happened there. Oh, there was a cyclone, same thing happened. Maybe that's a pattern. Oh, that happened over there too. Okay, there's a pattern now. You build a model like that. Trial and error, trial and error, trial and error. So that was our hypothesis. There are some biological information you know, Okay, methanogens do this, acidogens do this. But you ask a microbiologist, they say we still know only 1% of all the microbes. So we don't know all the time, right? So the idea is let's just get a diverse set of microbes, so 50 sludges. And we filled all these into these small digesters uh, known as serum bottles. Uh, and then we ran them all in the same way. So we fed them the same kind of food, same temperature, same conditions, right? So what do you think will happen if you have different set of microbes coming from different places, but treated the same way. So you assume that all the microbes are there somewhere. Some might have more of one, some might have less of the other, but all of them are there somewhere. Now, what do you think will happen if you treat them same way? Will they all become the same? No, I see some head nodding, no. Now this was kind of the debate going on all the time, uh, but you know, I'm, I don't know if there's a conclusion on that yet. Well, what happens? Would the microbes behave differently because the source was different? Or will they all eventually come and be similar, right? Uh, from what I remember, people used to say, if you treat them exactly the same way, no environmental, uh, external environment, everything is perfect, they will all become the same. Why? Functionally, they will all become the same because you're treating them the same way. That might be true, but from an engineering point of view, that's bad. 
because you don't want to wait for two years because that's what that research took two years for them to prove that yeah so in environmental engineering you want things to happen in a month no one's going to give you a million dollars to set up a design plan for two years right so you want things to happen quickly so we ran our systems so on the y axis you have the daily biogas production rate basically how much gas was coming out of these bottles every day right on the x axis it's the number of days so this is the starting day and then and you notice there was a small time when there was some level of convergence but then they spread out again so even after 80 days so they were running at a 20 day retention time so that's after four cycles of retention they are still not steady in the sense not all converged and we tried our best to keep the conditions the same so what does it, what does it show that what was the difference here the initial community right so that kind of shows the initial player matters right if you get a sludge from new jersey versus rhode island nothing to do with the states it's just what you're running it matters if you're running a brewery system it's better to get it from a brewery rather than a municipal digester if you're running a municipal digester it's better to get it from a municipal digester than a brewery because those microbes are adapted they are ready for the waste right that's what this shows right different microbes are adapted at different level it takes different time so from an engineering point of view that's not good because you want them to start immediately right so so that was our first finding that yeah you, you can spend 80 days 90 days and they are not still converging so we need to make sure you have the right microbes to do the job first point now the second point was can we predict digester function so what i did here so on day 80 right at the end i took a dna sample right so i took a dna sample over 6 days combined them and then i sequenced them so basically i know then how what the community is and i also know how much methane they produced so i have two variables right i know their microbial community and their function methane now i'm predicting so i what i did was i looked at all the digesters which produced good amount of methane right i call them good digesters and i looked at who were the microbes there and i looked at all the digesters which produced bad methane amount very less and i looked at who were the microbes there and then i ran a regression analysis just a simple linear regression analysis and then i answered the question can we predict digester function and the answer we got was yes so on the y axis you have the observed methane on the x axis you have the predicted methane so if a 100% prediction would be all lined up on this diagonal line so we got a variance of around uh, i think it was around 32% so basically we were able to explain 68% of the error uh but what what was our equation this equation over here and how many otus do you see otus are basically number of microbes right only 10 there were more than i think 2000 microbes overall but only using only 10 we were able to get this plot so that was another you know mind blowing result for us that it only took these 10 microbes to give us a prediction of all 150 digesters right without any physical information just the microbe information so this was our proof of concept to show that hey you can just use microbes to give you a decent prediction imagine what it will be if you combine everything right you combine the physical and the microbe and maybe also change the model the regression model is not the most sophisticated right it's like this times this plus that minus this you know it's that's not how microbes work right microbes are more complicated they might work with this microbe a little bit this microbe a little bit they might have a range of ph you have to include all that information so that's kind of where the next step would be so in conclusion we showed that the initial microbial community is important so if you want to start a brewery system get a brewery system digester sludge uh, don't get it from municipal so the initial sludge matters and the second you can get a direct quantitative correlation just using microbes now how do we take it further so i as i said we did regression modeling now the new thing is to use neural network modeling neural network is a powerful tool it's used in every field from health uh, to again uh, in ecological modeling as well so we want to use neural network modeling to just not just to model the microbes get us prediction but find interactions see that's another important thing if a model tells you that every time this microbe is here this microbe is here that means it's telling you there's some interaction here right just mathematically right that as a microbiologist then you can dig deeper to see like okay why would it be is there some kind of a you know uh, is it coincidental or is it an environmental aspect or is there something they're interacting so it builds more questions that you can try to answer 
So it helps in both ways, not just to make a model, but also understanding the microbiology of your system going forward. So that's what I want to take forward as well in terms of this kind of research. So I, I was in an anaerobic system. Now I'm going into an aerobic system to do research and maybe go to an ecosystem as well to look at an environmental, uh, external environment. It'll be tough, but that's how you know, we'll proceed further. So eventually you want to integrate this into that ADM1 model. So you have the physical and the biological information together. Uh, so with that, I'm just going to close out with talking about what ongoing research I have now. So vis-a-vis -vis related to nutrient recovery. Uh, so I'm looking at removal of organic phosphorus. So phosphorus in wastewater comes in different kinds. Inorganic phosphorus is the most common and easy to remove, but the organic phosphorus is tough to remove. Uh, it's, you know, it goes through all of our systems and then it causes a lot of issues when it comes to eutrophication. Also, a lot of the pesticides are organic phosphorus compounds. So I'm looking at using phosphatase enzyme. So those enzymes, hydrolytic enzymes to break these organic phosphorus, make them into inorganic phosphorus, and then you can remove it using existing technologies. So we are using a biological system in combination with a chemical system, both together. So that's using the enzyme. The other is to use microalgae. Microalgae have this enzyme, extracellular enzymes. So instead of just using the enzyme, we are going to use the microalgae system. So you have a microorganism system and a protein system. So those are the two research projects. Uh, I have one of them already going with a student in the environmental toxicology program, Giacomo. So he's, he's setting up the microalgae system right now. And other than that, uh, I want to uh, submit a proposal to NSF on looking at arsenic. So I identified three proteins which can grab arsenate, arsenite, and one which can grab a bit of both. And so remember, we can remove phosphorus by ignoring arsenic, but that's not the main important thing, right? You want to do it the other way. Remove arsenic by ignoring phosphorus, right? Because the existing absorbent is bombarded by phosphorus. So they don't, they're not able to remove any arsenic because there's more phosphorus than arsenic in the environment. But if you imagine if you have an absorbent which can specifically target arsenic, that does not exist right now. Again, Mother Nature has a solution. So that's kind of what my project is to look at these proteins specifically. And the other project, not necessarily related to biotechnology, but I wanted to mention, uh, uh, one of the major projects we are doing is to figure out a way to provide clean rural wastewater treatment for the Alabama Black Belt. Uh, as you know, they don't have any distribution or a sewer system in most of that region. And they also have clay soils, which is not good for the traditional septic system. You know, in septic system, the water is, what happens to the water in the septic system? Anyone know? Some magic button, everything goes? No, right. So from the septic system, they usually spread it on their backyard leach bed and it goes into the ground. But when you have clay soil, it doesn't go into the ground, it pools. And then you have a pool of sewage. And that's why you have diseases like roundworm infection and stuff cropping up over there, which is bad, right? So how do we do this? Well, it's expensive to put treatment systems, centralized treatment systems, takes a lot of money, we don't have it. Alabama is not the richest state. So what do we do? We make decentralized systems. So every few houses have their own systems, right? But again, that costs money. So we are coming up with new innovative ways using sand filters, above ground sand filters. So this is one of the students. So we're building these sand filters, which can take care of wastewater from three or four houses each, right? And these are sand. You can place it over the clay soil. Everyone's married, basically. So that's kind of the research I'm looking into. And the final one is to look at bioplastic management. A uh, lot of our plastic is going to be replaced by bioplastic soon. Even though they claim it can be degraded, it does not. Uh, it only get, it degrades in your lab. Uh, it doesn't degrade in landfills at all, right? So we need to find a way to also get rid of this bioplastic soon. A lot of your Walmart food is now bioplastic. That's what they use. So all this has to be used as well. So looking at biological ways of converting this bioplastic to methane or some other useful product is the other side of research. So with that, I'll end by thanking my team from Marquette, all the professors and the students, also all my team at uh, South Alabama. I'm still a newbie, so they're helping me a lot getting settled in the department and also the students who are working on the projects that I just mentioned. With that, I thank you again for inviting me. It was Great pleasure being here, meeting all of you, learning about the research going on, and I hope to come back here again and collaborate as well. Thank you.
All right, so thanks, Kashif. Um, so any questions from our audience? We've already, okay, Dr. Valentine. Yeah, we historically have had a rather strange conversation on methyl mercury. Okay. And I wonder how this could relate to bioremediation and methyl mercury it shows up in fish and all kinds of things. Uh, so methyl mercury, um... I have to look into that specifically. I know when I was looking into all these proteins for removal, uh, I did come across a protein which can absorb mercury. Uh, it's also a protein which can absorb lead at the same time. So it's not necessarily a specific protein. I think it just likes to grab a metal, a heavy metal. So there are proteins out there which can do that. I'm not sure if there is anything specific for methyl mercury as such, because that's now a complex molecule. So yeah, just have to think on that. I don't know. So concentrated phosphorus is a problem in the oceanographic literature. And the way we do it is we use the ionic strength based solution and using this co-precipitation. Okay. So you talked about the problem of ionic strength. Well, one of the things that those methods do is they're really good at, at, at uh, field level concentrations, like nanomolars of nanograms. What's the limit that you guys have found on this protein in terms of where it still has its affinity. Does that happen? There is some point yeah. where it goes, and is that relevant to the field? Because having an organic like this could be very interesting for applying it the way that they use it, because it doesn't need so with the magnesium, we know that we're studying the hydroxide in the KGH11, yeah. and then magnesium will scavenge it. And it's also been scavenged arsenic and so everything. Everything else. Everything else. That would go on in the magnesium. So first like this is really effective, but so the affinity we found in our immobilized system was around uh, point, was it, point oh, it was around 0. 0.05 to 0. 0.1 micromolar. So that's what I would say like 10 micrograms, 10 to 5 micrograms per liter. Yeah, not in nanograms as such, but. Well, then we, uh, what I got stuck with is our measurement system. Uh, you know, we use the general spec kits, we, you know, and uh, the detection limit was 10 micrograms per liter for those systems. I mean, yeah, so that was where we got stuck with, like, you know, and it, from the environmental aspect, the regulation aspect, it worked because the regulation right now is in 50. So we are in tens. Uh, but to get to nano, yeah, we need an instrument which can first <laughs> get us down to that level to measure it as well. Yeah, yeah. But uh, as far as I know, I don't think it does. If anyone has published it, I don't know yet if it can do that. Allie? For your second set of experiments where you got um, the different samples from the 49th state, you only did your community analysis at the end, at the last six days? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So that one, that project, that was a good question because we got that question from our reviewers when we were publishing as well. Uh, because yeah, it's a good point. What's a snapshot? You know, you know microbes, I mean, even if you sample it twice from the same bottle, you're gonna get different things, right? We're not that standardized yet. So that was the question, why did you do it that way? Plainly, my answer was proof of concept. Like, think about this. A snapshot was able to give you that much. Now, if you were like, let's say a treatment plant who was monitoring it monthly, which is one of the projects we are doing right now, uh, that would obviously add more information because you have a background information of your system and news information of the system. This can only work in this experiment because we treated all of them the same way in a lab. Otherwise, this hypothesis would not work, this snapshot hypothesis, yeah. Yeah. Oh, in that graph, why do you think they sort of converge in the their performance before diversity? Oh. Oh yeah, okay, the biogas one, right? Okay. This one, this one. Ooh, actually, to be honest, that part was very easy to explain when it was happening, <laughs> which is like, oh, they're converging. This is what we want to see, right? But eventually, yeah, I mean, that's a, they're still not stable, basically. I mean, I don't have a good answer to that. Like everything seemed well, they were all the pH were all neutral, but all of a sudden the one which were healthy before were still going, kept going down. And then they came back up again. I didn't stop at 80, it went to like 120 or something. 
but they all came back. But again, there was still enough widespread that I can't say they converged. So the idea is, yeah. Sorry. So the idea was that it took a long time to converge in general. Yes. Uh, to me, this looks like a normal variability with, you know, adding a microcodal. Uh, so I'm doing the statistics on it to see if there's uh, any difference. Was there a statistical difference? Uh, there was a statistical difference, yeah. There were, I mean, again, it depends on how, there were statistical difference in, uh, I would say, more than half of the systems, even in that, in that, uh, in that region, in the middle region as well, yeah. Uh, I would say we were able to differentiate the system in like eight groups of systems, eight out of 149, which is still pretty good, but yeah. So out of those 50 states, did you notice a, a variability with um, colder climates? No, we did. We tried to find that. But here's the problem with that, because we ran them all in our lab for like 80 days. So those all those differences would have wiped out by now. But again, that's another project that's, everyone was interested in that question when we said 50 states and we did not do that part. The only thing we forgot to do was take an initial sample and ran it. That would have been in its own paper, <laughs> but we didn't do that. Yeah. Yeah. When you were working with your uh, co that were extracting uh, phosphate and uh, having about the bees, uh, what kind of problems, how did they perform when you were trying to keep them off to high temperatures? Was that uh, phosphate at all and did not perform as well? No, it did not. So we didn't go above 45 because that's kind of the denaturing limit said. Um, and also our incubators, we didn't want to cook anything else <laughs> more than that, all our rotators and stuff. Uh, nothing happened. Uh, the proteins were also fine, by the way. They didn't get denatured at all, uh, but they did not release anything. No, it was the pH one was also was, we, our limit was to go to 10 because that's what all our theory said, like 10 they release. But I accidentally went to 12 and I thought it was a mistake. It one of those chance findings, right? You do it and all of a sudden I saw so much phosphorus and I was like, oh, maybe it's a mistake. I did it again. Same result, they did it twice. Then, five. then I had to explain how they are surviving PH2. That was a headache to explain like, because no one writes about it, right? So yeah, that, yeah, it's one of those, you know, accidental findings you can say when you do an experiment, right? Yeah, those are the best, yeah. Especially when you don't have to write about it. Are there any questions from the online audience? Yeah, so um, in the chat or anything, Brandy is monitoring for questions in the chat. So for those in the virtual land, please say so if you have a question. If not, please join me in thanking. Um, Thank <laughs> you.